And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Pamela Leitze, who is herself Vice President of Academic and Student Affairs and Associate Professor of Constructive Theology at Meadville Lombard Theological School. She, she's an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church Northern Illinois Conference um, and has served in parish ministry before she began her time in higher education. Uh, Dr. Leitze uh, served in the U.S. Army and as a civil servant. Then she earned a bachelor's degree from Columbus State University, a Master's of Divinity from Gammon Seminary of the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, and a doctorate from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. She is a constructive theologian, as I said, the author of Our Lives Matter, a, queer, a womanist queer theology, which really grew out of her time in the streets with other activists, herself also an activist, in Ferguson during and along the Ferguson uprising. She has been, and I would say is still, a leading social justice activist throughout her vocational life and currently throughout the world. Uh, I make note of her work both in Ferguson in Chicago, her work in Brazil, and in other places, focusing primarily on the causes of peacemaking, racial justice, and LGBTQIA plus rights. She is a womanist scholar, and I know her, her from her, our, her role both as a womanist scholar, and if she wants to say something about that, she can. Otherwise, Google will bless your life. You can look it up. She's a womanist scholar and an activist, and I know her from those roles. I don't know how long we've known each other, but it's been long enough that we can call each other and go, girl, uh, if you're black, you really understand that. If you're not, you can't Google that. So this afternoon, she spoke to us about dying towards life and um, the anxiety around death that keeps us from living toward a queer womanist theology of hope. Tonight, she's going to continue that conversation um, in, her, in her, her lecture called Soul Tending Amidst Body Snatchers. Would you help me welcome again to this podium Dr. Pamela Leitze. Thank you so much, Dr. Bridgman, and to all of you who have come here tonight. Um, and just to hear the maybe, you know, not necessarily the ramblings, but the inner thoughts um, of a theologian as she is making her way through um, reflections about where we are in our nation, where we are in our world and how we can be better human beings in light of all of that. So I'm very honored to be with you tonight. I'm thankful um, for the invitation that was sent. I'm thankful for the gracious hospitality of all and to see friends and colleagues yet again. Now let me begin. I'm going to begin with a slide, um, a just short clip that I wanted to show this morning only because it so blesses me and I think it will bless you. Uh, and it addresses, in some ways, uh, it, it kind of fl adds flavor to what, to the ways that I want to start the lecture. Fear is your enemy. Whoa, easy now. I'm gonna be free or die. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll arise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just because I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. <laughs> Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, 
shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just because I laugh as if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness. But just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh. <laughs> Does it come as a surprise that I dance? As if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. <laughs> Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling and bearing in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave and so. There I go. <laughs> I'm going to be free or die. Does my sexiness offend you? Uh, these, these two sentences, these two comments are um, really move me both as a black woman and as a queer lesbian. Because I know those questions provoke a whole lot of people. The sentence itself that I'm going to be free or die, I'm going to be free or die, uh, is, is historically um, the attitude, the posture that we've had to take in order to live. Earlier today, I shared some of the work that I'm doing for my next publication. That work deals with a subject that my daughter hates, to, hates for me to talk about, death. It's too morbid. It's too personal. Preparing for the time when I will no longer be with her is practical to me, but it's way too painful for her. And so I skirt around it by asking indirect questions like, you remember where my will and all my passwords are, don't you? For me, a theology of death is necessary, especially necessary in order to explore what it means to be free. Earlier today, I made the case that we need death in order to live, and we need hope in order to die, or at least to accept death. We cannot die unless we have, in fact, lived. I describe dying as a part of life that we are, as is often said, dying from the moment of our birth. I contended that death is with us each day as a kind of anxiety that we set aside. We set it aside in order to live, to live accepting our interdependence with other human beings. Moreover, the unwillingness to accept that interdependence is the willingness to embrace a kind of daily morbidity of the spirit. I suppose I could also argue uh, a daily rotting of the body because I certainly believe that the bitterness of bigotry leaves poisonous toxins in the body. I'm not a physician, but I stand on that. This is where I feel the United Methodist Church is right now, precariously close to death due to its exclusion of the members of the body of Christ that it needs in order to survive, this being a steady march of the church to its institutional death. It must die. It must die. And the church triumphant shall live. The way that I think that I'm going with this project is to bookend my theological argument about life between a theological analysis on the subjects of death and the sacred rites. 
I end tonight with the sacred rites because they have historically reminded Christians that our mortal bodies are sites of what is sacred in this life. The rites are means for soul tending. I dress the rites because they point to something outside of ourselves, even as they symbolize our collective participation in a dimension of life that surpasses death itself. I don't think that I'm painting too broad of brush strokes when I say that for many, the rites, the R-I-T-E-S, the rites of the church have been worth dying for. On the other hand, I start with death and dying because I just don't want to empower death by setting it up as a sort of ending, a sort of that's it, that's all you did. I feel it is always with us and facing death, facing the tragic is the posture we must have in order to live without despair. It is not what Jesus and, and this is actually what Jesus did. Jesus faced death in order to take away its sting. I'm not suggesting a kind of pessimism, nihilism, fanaticism, or naivete about life. On the contrary, I am suggesting a boldness about life in the midst of death and struggle and oppression. As you will hear, I am unashamed situating the lives and history of black people in my work. Some people are uncomfortable drawing upon the history of oppression of black people in America, but I have read enough misinformation on social media to convince me that we don't teach enough about this history, that students don't learn, have not learned enough about black history, and so misinformation prevails. So yeah, when you read my work, I draw upon that context. I write from my lens just like Bart, like Calvin, like Kierkegaard, like Hawass, and I draw from that lens as they drew from their perspective, their lens, their context. Uh, theologians really gobble this up. Uh, these ways of, um, in these writings from uh, white male theologians who um, basically became paragons of theological virtue in academia. And so I feel it is my responsibility, I see it as part of my job as a woman is to serve another menu. My thoughts about death, the rights, and LGBTQ liberation draw from that deep well of suffering, surviving, resisting, and thriving. I have this particular experience of being the progeny of a people who had the tenacity to survive slaveocracy. I believe it had something to do with their cunningness about life and death itself. The strength and tenacity to open their eyes each day, to keep on keeping on, believing the body could be destroyed, but not the soul. The wisdom to disregard any teaching that defined them as mere property, and yes, the brilliance to carve out a theology that stood in stark contrast to the theology of whiteness so acceptable to most of the church leadership in early America. And these conditions were not limited to America. My thoughts about body snatchers, which I'm using tonight, began with a trip that I took last year in Paris, and Dr. Bridgman was there with us. In her early 18th century work, Portrait de Negresse, now hanging in Le Louvre, French artist Marie Guillemine, La Ville, Le Robe, Benoist, captures the image of her subject, a black servant woman, her body partially draped in white fabric, her hair mostly covered in a head wrap of the same fabric, her right breast 
exposed, gold looped earring dangling from her right ear as she is seated in an elegant armchair gazing toward the spectator artist. Though the work is captured after a time quite close to the abolition of slavery in France, when such portraits of black people had become both acceptable and popular, the subject is initially not revealed in name or in status. The subject's name, Madeleine, is only made known more than 200 years later. In this era, her image is set before a much larger audience as the painting is beautifully framed within Beyonce and husband Jay-Z's ape, ape, shit, ape shit video. Therefore, Madeline's image is exalted within the artistic black pride genre rather than critiqued as it was in the 18th century. And it was critiqued as, and as it was called, black stain. Madeline's body, more precisely, the image of her body <coughs> became public spectacle under not the pseudoscientific, but the artistic and Parisian public. The black female body in this case, if I may use an analysis by Sean Copeland, emerges from the spectacle of inspection as the spectacular. Her body is remade by power and pleasure or exhibition and display, end quote. The spirit of the body snatchers, and no, I, I have not seen the movie, but I do have the book. The spirit of the body snatchers, this spirit that demands assimilation and conformity, is a present day blight in our churches. The quest for LGBTQ liberation from oppression by the church, or more precisely, liberation from oppressive denominational polity is the current struggle. As you know, this struggle is against norms and polity inscribed as a result of the kinds of literal biblical interpretations and conceptualizations of God and the ecclesia that often belie the very sensibilities about love, grace, faith, and pneumatology that its ministers espouse on a weekly basis. Biblical interpretation, actually the debate over biblical authority, these days seem never ending. And though unspoken, there is the premise that our sacramental theology, our beliefs about sacred symbols, liturgy, and liturgy, and, and, and ritual is in jeopardy. The most important breaking points are not theoretical but about our material, fleshly lives, about how LGBTQ persons live in their bodies. This is not an innocuous position on the part of the church, but rather one that has divided and torn families apart. But some relationships survive out of the sheer tenacity and the love of the family members. Here's one example. Life was good. Our amazing children grew into amazing adults. And we had our trusted community. Then one day the phone rang and everything changed. It was Annie calling from college. She was 20. I was wiping down the white tile counter in my bathroom when Annie says, Mom, I got something to tell you. I'm attracted to girls. I think I'm bisexual. I prayed about it, Mom. I've resisted it, but it won't go away. Now I know what you're thinking. You're hoping I whipped out a rainbow flag and said, Annie, that's totally fine. We accept you just the way you are. But that's not quite what happened. See, I had nothing against LGBTQ people, really. But after 20 years in the evangelical church, I believed that being gay was somehow wrong. I love my daughter, and I thought I had to protect her. 
So I said, Annie, don't give in. We'll support you. How can I help? As I hung up the phone, my heart sank. I knew we'd never be the same in the church again. Later, at Bible study, I shared with some of my closest friends, hoping they'd give me some wisdom. Instead, they just went straight to the rules. They said, being gay is a sin and you can't accept it. (laughs) Not accept my daughter? What does that even mean? I was devastated. I realized I was being asked to choose between the two most important parts of my life, my child and my church. I chose my child. What else was I going to do? I chose Annie. And we left the church. We lost our community. And eight years later, half our family still doesn't speak to us. My faith was fraying at the edges. I needed to understand this. And what does the Bible even really say about it anyway? I needed to understand, and I began to read everything I could. I even went to seminary. And I learned that most Christians do accept LGBTQ people. Yeah. And I also realized that I had become extremely judgmental. That was a really hard realization. But I began the deep process of deconstructing that judgment. So, let me make some connections here for us. That I, I, it's almost like puzzle pieces that I'm putting together here for us. Um, the, the woman that you just heard from uh, is Susan Cottrell. She helped start PFLAG. Um, and her story is a phenomenal story, but what you get in that clip what you get in that clip is the struggle that she has, that she and her family had to face, and many other people had to, have had to face, and that's the struggle with what, with how to how to exist in the church, when the church actually actually feels like it's tearing not just you apart, but that it's tearing your family apart, and that it's tearing your family apart on the basis of the very the very thing that you hold most sacred, and that's your understanding of what the Bible is saying and how the Bible relates to you as a human being, okay? So, and so, the ways that I see this is that this is not the first time, okay, that the church has been in this position. This is not the first time that the church has used the biblical text to assault the bodies of human beings, okay? This is not the first time that the church has somewhat uh, asserted itself as superior, not, not, not only to families, not only to who we are, but, but asserted itself as superior to life itself, okay? And um, the church does not do this alone, okay? People buy into People buy into the theology of the church, they buy into the interpretations of the church, and they buy into the theology of the church, and in some ways, the theology of the church informs their bigotry. In other ways, the theology of the church, okay, the the bigotry of the person, okay, that person utilizes the theology of the church, okay? So it's, it's, it's a certain synergy that's going on. I, I've grown up with a, so to say, the person has grown up with a certain sensibility about other human beings, and the church actually, the teachings of the church help that person to justify what they think about other human beings. 
On the other hand, the church grooms its own bigots. Okay? Bigots are groomed from the church seats. So let me, let me, let me, let me move to the rights of the church, R-I-T-E-S, okay? The I, and, 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 and this is just a classic way of thinking about how the church is utilized to support bigotry, okay? So the idea of conveying the rights, the R-I-T-E-S, of the church upon those who are, who are understood as mere chattel, okay, as property, was strenuous, strenuously opposed in their early colonies. Now, the, now, in the 15th century, the papal bulls justified slavery as an act with the ultimate goal of converting infidels to Christ. Okay. So we're going to use slavery to bring Jesus to these infidels. And in the case of England, okay, this conversion through baptism, conversion through baptism, the idea was that that conversion through baptism might also make justifiable claims for freedom. In the American colony, slave owners often allowed the right of baptism to the enslaved, but refused to thereafter set them free. Now, follow where I'm going. The rights of the church, okay, the idea that the, that the rights of the church should be withheld was sustained on the idea that one does not convey the rights on the, of the church on, on any, other, any other being but human being, okay? The rights of the church are not conveyed to animals as much as we love our animals, as much as we love our pets, only human beings, okay, are, are able to, only human beings receive the rights of the church. And because the slave, the enslaved, were not thought of as human beings, the rights of the church could therefore be withheld. Because what? If, you, if you're going to convey the rights, then you are ipso facto saying they're human beings. Okay? And the ways, of the, in the ways the text was interpreted specifically accommodated slavocracy in America. Thus, the church was no more than an arm of the state. And I'm going to return to that. The church was no more than an arm of the state, much in, much in the same ways that the church nowadays is becoming no more, or can be seen. We can make the argument that the church is no more than an arm for the state. The hierarchy of the church walked hand in hand with the state. For example, on September the 23rd, 1667, the colony of Virginia passed an act which stated, and you can read it, basically what the act was stating was that um, though you confer baptism upon a slave, that doesn't mean that they, they, they receive their freedom. So they codified this idea that baptism will not, does not in and of itself say that this slave is human, okay? And it, doesn't, it does not give to, okay? It does not give to the slave or their children a condition of freedom, but based upon the sacrament itself. So I offer this history because it's important to remember that sacramental theology, in example, baptism, just as every theological undertaking, has been influenced by our context. Inasmuch as there is the right, the R-I-T-E of baptism, there is also the human experience. The sacredness of human life ought not be disentangled from the observance of religious rituals of the classical tradition. That's my argument. More than sacred, these rituals are also communal in nature. They're sacred in the sense of their historic and spiritual meaning in classical and contemporary ecclesiology. ecclesiology. They are sacred in as much as humans, in as much as humans perceive them as divinely inspired and collectively commit to their meaning and their meaning-making. 
at the point at which human beings do not receive the sacraments as sacred, at the point at which they, have, they, do, they, they do, are not perceived as meaning-making, then they're no longer sacramental. Basically, I'm saying human beings buy, have bought into the rites as being sacred, okay? That is, and, and that the rites give meaning to our very lives. The rites give meaning to our lives. Let me now make a small shift. Since antiquity, the church has wrestled with at least two ideas when it comes to the rituals. And this is an important shift, small but important. The two ideas, the efficacy of the ritual, that is its benefits, and the validity of the ritual, that is the acceptability of the ritual. Now keep in mind that at the same time one speaks of the efficacy, the efficacy, the benefits of the ritual, one must also speak of the validity of the ritual. For instance, let's stay with the ritual of baptism. In many Christian traditions, the efficacy, the benefit of baptism, an example, the cancellation of the debt of sin, the remission of sins, you hear, you know, this is for the remission of sins, the deliverance from death and receipt of the Holy Spirit are conferred upon the individual who has repented of what? Repented of sin and agrees to live a life that demonstrates that repentance. This is what we hear in our Protestant, in our Christian traditions. Neither is the, the validity, excuse me, the validity of the ritual of baptism, its acceptability, is an act of grace. Okay. The validity of the ritual is an act of grace. It is acceptable by the divine, not by anything that we do, but this is an act of grace. Neither is the ritual made valid because of the purity of the minister or perfection in reading every single word of the liturgy. Now, if that was the case, we'd all be, we'd be messed up. What is at stake in the efficacy of baptism and the validity of baptism for LGBTQ persons, as with any human being seeking baptism, in most Christian denominations, hinges upon confession spoken during the liturgy that sufficiently demonstrate to the ecclesia, the gathering of believers, that the individual has repented of sin, received the good news of the gospel message, and is committed to a Christian lifestyle. You see this, you hear this in the liturgies that are spoken uh, during these rituals. What if an aspiring candidate for baptism declares that they are unashamedly lesbian or gay. What if the pastor of the church refuses to baptize his candidate and refuses to allow the membership into that local church unless they take a vow of celibacy? What if the efficacy of the ritual for this candidate is based solely on the pastor's belief that practicing homosexuality is sin. Now stick a pin in those questions. I'm framing something here. What if your pastor, the one who baptized you, comes out publicly as a gay man? What if the denomination says that everyone baptized by this pastor, now declared a sinner, must be rebaptized in order to ensure the validity of the ritual? You all follow me? Now, most theologians and church historians know that the second example was addressed by Augustine, Calvin, and others. You know, you theologians, you scholars, 
okay? You know that the sacrament is acceptable not on the basis of the officiant, but on ex opere operato operato Christi, Latin for from the work worked. Divine, even otherworldly, and not the work of any human being. The, sacri the sacrament, okay, is acceptable based upon not the officiant, but it is acceptable based upon what Christ has done. That's what we say. Okay. It is a long-held position of the church universal that the sacraments are valid in and of themselves because of what Christ has done for and promised to the church. Though the ministers officiate the sacrament, the grace conferred through the sacrament is not dependent on the holiness of the minister, but rests in the very mystery of the faith. Thank God. <laughs> As to ordination, the question floating around my context, the United Methodist communities, is usually put this way. Why do they, LGBTQ candidates, feel entitled to ordination? Why can't they submit to the authority of scripture and denominational guidelines? These questions, friends, make the assumption that LGBTQ aspiring clergy see ordination as an individual right and scriptural authority as a thing that binds rather than frees one to obedience. That's the underlining assumption here. They also assume the movement that the movement resists communal covenant and discipline. In truth, LGBTQ persons are entirely aware and hoping to enter and submit to a communal process that values the discernment of the representational of the representative denominational body. They enter the process more often than not having had their leadership shaped by interactions within a local church, having been baptized in these churches very often, and deeply, they deeply value the rights of the denomination as communal in nature and belonging to the entire church. Therefore, we question the silencing and deceptive practices that hinder the community, the entire church, not merely one wing of the church. We question the silencing that hinder the community by way of delegate votes, et cetera, et cetera, that hinder the community from discerning what is best for us during this era in time. I offer these examples not because I believe the disposition of the parishioner or the pastor matter most, nor do I offer them as a way of relativizing the rituals. I do not. I offer these examples because over the last couple of decades of working for LGBTQ rights to both receive and confer the RITES, as well as being accepted as members with full rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, I've watched well-meaning persons struggle to make sense out of the ways many church leaders have contorted, offered spin narrative, and resorted to gaslighting to maintain power and control. In my denomination, we are near schism because we disagree upon the definition of sin, who is sinful, and the unspoken, this is most important, this is more important than even sin, the unspoken, irrational fear of much that has to do with LGBTQ persons. But most specifically, the irrational fear and belief that LGBTQ persons living in sin will somehow sully the rituals, make nasty the rituals over which they preside. An individual's right to enjoy the rights 
of the church is not solely about individual rights, but the community's rights. For what is also at stake in the struggle for rights and rights within our denominations is our understanding of ecclesia, the the collective gathering of believers, the authority of scriptures, the hermeneutics, and yes, matters of equity and justice. Our liberation and flourishing ensure the denomination remains a legitimate reflection of the church universal. Participation in the rights of the church is paramount to its ability to effect virtue. Important to it being perceived as an instrument in the process of building the beloved kingdom, which Martin Luther King talked about, paramount to its prophetic witness in the world. It is not precise, let me caution us, it's not precise to say that our doctrine, dogma, or theology affect virtue, make us virtuous, make us do good. They do not. History has shown that they must be understood as capable of affecting virtue, virtue capable of guiding us into leading moral, ethical lives. For without that understanding, they will not be obeyed or implemented. And I admit that 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 puts us in a precarious position of determining by our own human understanding what ought not be obeyed or ignored. I also admit I'm really somewhat cool with that. And I say this after years of watching as clergy the arrogance, the pomposity, and the poor training of church leaders and laity. I say this knowing that the third highest number of representative leadership of the current Congress, persons creating public policy that affect the lives of LGBTQ persons are members of the United Methodist Church. Remember I talked about the church being the arm of the state? I champion free will, freedom of thought and speech, human agency, but I'm not cool with the idea that liberation can be achieved by the individual, divorced from community, a body of accountability. We are now at a point where the struggle for both rights and rights has entered what is considered the holiest of places, church altars, where the rituals are administered and the officiant blesses the elements. The struggle for liberation is both on the streets and in our places of worship. It has always been it. It's why we speak of the black church as having been birthed from the wounds of radical resistance. It is why what is to become of the church universal will come, must come, because liberation is that a priori nature of humanity and the eternal will of all that is holy. I repeat, liberation is that a priori nature of humanity and the eternal will of all that is holy. The church, in its most prophetic nature, can help us achieve justice and equality, and yet the unwillingness of church leaders to allow full and balanced participation of its adherence in the sacred rights of the denomination has identified the church, sadly, as an adversary in the struggle for human rights. I need not remind us of the Crusades and certainly, most recently, the Kurds, immigrant children, and the poor. Churches, denominations have a history of being on the wrong side of justice and the leadership of the church is being utilized as arms of the state that wields a very deadly, a very deadly uh, politics. In truth, this is not about LGBTQ love and lives, but I believe that the struggle for rights within the church is about the willingness of so many people to exclude human beings from the community of faith 
And here we go back to a livable life, bodies, and death. Very few theologians express this better than my late colleague and mentor, Reverend Dr. James Cohn. And so I think it's fitting to end with his words tonight. Today, black and white churches are doing the same thing, excluding queer people from their community, saying, I love the sinner, hate the sin. Now, I never heard Jesus say that. saying, I love black people, but I don't want them in my community. I don't want them in my church. But I say as long as you are silent and do nothing about homophobia and white supremacy and all these other evils, you are just as guilty as the one who hung black on trees and queer people on picket fences. Just like Peter was silent when the Romans hung Jesus on the cross. Black Simon took up the cross that Simon Peter was supposed to bear. If you are going to worship somebody that was nailed to a tree, you must know that the life of a disciple of that person is not going to be easy you may end up on a tree too. Just like Jesus, blacks and gays that whites and straight people despise. And so in this sense, we have to take seriously the Christian faith. I ask we will end up doing the opposite of what that faith means. Thank you. Do we have our, wow. Um, we, thank you. I have so many thoughts going through my head, but she and I are gonna have other conversations. This is now your time to have conversations with Dr. Lightsey. If you have questions, you have to be on the mic. We have two runners. Raise your hand high if you have a question. And, and I do mean question. <laughs> Dr. Lightsey, over here. <laughs> do you attend in um, Chicago a Reconciling Ministries Church? This is a very good question. <laughs> because you're getting at the complexity of being black and being queer. Um, the first uh, time that I lived in Chicago, I attended Broadway United Methodist Church, which is certainly affirming, works closely with Reconciling Ministries. Its pastor was nearly defrocked for officiating a wedding of two gay men. I did that in some ways as an affront to black folk. You know, I mean, I'm going, you know. This time, and to the, to the homophobia that I felt was, that I was fighting against in black church spaces, I've grown some since then. So when I returned to Chicago this time, I went to a black church, I attend a black church that's not reconciling ministry are not associated with it fully. Its pastor is affirming. And um, because I need, 
I, I don't know any other way to say it. I need black church space. I need that flavor. It is how I was, and I'm not saying that, you know, that all black churches are alike, but there are some common denominators, and maybe that has to do with the history of struggle, of the struggles of black people in America. So I need that space, and I was kind of missing that space. My other church was a beautiful, beautiful church. I love the members, diverse community, um, but I miss the liturgy of the black church. And which could not be replicated as best they tried. I wanted to ask what hope do you have, if any, for those of us who are currently seeking ordination in the United Methodist Church? Hope is the most asked question I get after lectures as an LGBTQ person. So I, can, I will share with you, I'm prepared for that question now. Okay. <laughs> So I think one of the reasons people ask me about hope is because of an uneasiness to deal with the trauma and the drama of our current conditions. To sit in the ugliness of bigotry. We, we would rather shift from the ugliness of that bigotry and think about happy and hopeful things, would we not? Uh, and we would, uh, for those who are considering candidacy, um, who wants to face the possibility, the ugly possibilities that might come against them uh, as either an ally or as an LGBTQ person? I don't have a hope elixir. I really, I don't have one I, th I want to encourage, I try to encourage people who ask me that question now to sit with the horrors of bigotry and go deep into your own space, your own self, and to, t to determine where is hope for you. Because hope for me is going to be different. Because I'm a different person, I come from a different history, a different context. And I just, I, there's no way that I can answer that question efficiently for you. But I, I will tell you um, that I think if you sit with, if you really sit with the trauma that's going on, that there is a way for you to move and develop some, some maneuvers, if I will, if I can. I had to develop. And I think you can. Dr. Lightsey, mm -hmm. uh, as a migrant from Pentecostalism into the United Methodist Church, um, I would like to hear you speak around the rights, R-I-T-E-S, and the rights in relationship to the Methodist quadri quadrilateral. Because I am always struck by how rooted this conversation is in biblical literacism. It, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in my Pentecostal tradition, it wasn't so steep. I mean, you see what I'm saying? It wasn't, it really was not, it was not, I don't want to say, it was serious, but it wasn't so steep. Methodists hold the Wesleyan quadrilateral as though it's um, a diamond not to be touched, not to be interrogated. Um, the history, and even why we call it the quadrilateral, uh, is worthy of interrogation. I think when it comes, for me, when it comes to the rights as a and I say this seriously, some people play with it. As a person who was raised from a young age in the Baptist tradition, to the Pentecostal tradition, to the Methodist tradition, every one of those traditions goes about the rights differently. They have their own history. They have their own particular embrace of the rights. And even we Protestants have 
various ideas about the rights that are different than the Catholic Church. You know? it's, essentially what I'm saying is human beings determine what, what is going to be the particular rights, the most important rights of their denomination, their churches. Okay? Much like I was talking about how unless we hold them as meaningful, they mean nothing. Okay? And Methodists hold these rights almost on the same level as the Christ, as Christ himself. And to some extent, that's dangerous because we have, in some ways, made the rights our idols rather than hold the rights as symbolic. Now, the Pentecostal church, Pentecostal church, that I came from, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, understood the rights very much so as symbolic, differently than the United Methodists. They were symbolic. We held them with a kind of aura about them. Uh, but on a Sunday morning, if the Spirit took control when we were to receive the Eucharist, the pastor would say, look, Spirit don't came in here. Y'all just move that. We'll have communion another Sunday. You see what I'm saying? So it wasn't as though the rights were um, an untouchable feature of the church and no one could ascend to them. Does that get at your question? Um, I, I'm also wondering, I, I guess what I'm really trying to get at um, is the way this conversation that you have surfaced for us has been framed as biblical uh, yeah. um, and 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 kind of what you said about people saying why do why do queer people think they should whatever since it's not quote biblical and I and I'm wondering if there's something about this migration into the United Methodist Church and these sort of four areas mm -hmm. that can help you address that question. Yeah, to the extent that we hold bibl biblical literacy or we see the word of God as the unadulterated word of God as though it comes from the mouth of God and we hold that intention with the rights then, anyone who uh, troubles that water is anathema, yeah? Uh, but when we see the, the text and the rites and all of the ways of doing liturgy and the church itself uh, as part of the human condition, as part of, of how we interpret even God, God's self, I think then we are freed as human beings to live as human beings and to respect one another as human beings and to kind of struggle with these things as symbols and as questions and as mysteries of our faith. The, uh, the other, in, the, uh, in the other way, we, we, we can't fully embrace them as mysteries of the faith if we make them concrete, concretely the word of God. There's, there's no place for us to move. There's, there's, there's nothing for us to do with that but toe the line. And that's where we are in the church. You toe the line and you get out. I just wanted to thank you for um, everything, but especially for using baptism as one of your examples, because uh, when our son came out as gay and my husband and I supported him, we were shunned out of our Methodist church. It was really bad. But what really pissed me off was remembering that sacrament of baptism mm -hmm when my little baby boy was held up before that congregation and those bigots promised. Yes. They yes. promised. And didn't they break their promise? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I agree with you. I mean, we, uh, if we're not going to, if, 
if this thing about being people of sacred worth is going to be more than cliche, which it presently is for many denominations, not just United Methodists, to say that LGBTQ persons are persons of sacred worth makes the evangelicals, the fundamentalists, it makes those who believe in biblical literacy feel real good about themselves. And it, it's, you know, love the sinner, they love you. Uh, they love us, I love all people, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the extent that they can say that, then they feel comfortable, but to hold the church's feet to the proverbial fire is to say that unless, unless you're willing to also, also carry forth the covenant you made at baptism for the babies, for the souls, then we're not being true to the rights that we officiate, the sacraments that we offer in our church. And we might as well just not have the sacraments in our church. Because, it's, yeah, because the sacraments, as I'm, as I'm saying, the sacraments are not individualistic. The sacraments are for the community. And they don't, they are not, a, they, are, they are not, they are not effective outside of the collective. That's why as a clergy person, I do not serve communion to, at, a, at a wedding ceremony to only those two that are getting married. I serve communion to everyone gathered there. If you want to have communion at your wedding, everybody's getting some communion. Not just you, because it's communal. Everybody's getting some grape juice and some wafer. <laughs> So true. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you very mm -hmm. much for being here today. Um, so, thinking about the title of um, soul tending among body snatching, and your description earlier today about the trouble that churches have with queer folks and the way we use our bodies mm. to love one another um, as a reason to reject us from community. Uh, one of the things that I'm troubled by um, of late are churches, particularly evangelical churches, that are repackaging themselves in ways where they are welcoming of our queer bodies in word, welcoming of our queer money and their offering plates. But when it comes time to sing or to preach or to teach or to lead, then our souls are snatched away from us again because of our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and we're re-traumatized all over again because of a bait and switch. And so I wonder what What, what do you think we should do as queer people, as queer people of faith, and then also messages for our allies to combat that in particular? I think it's a special kind of evil that's perpetrated by these churches who are re-traumatizing mm -hmm. those of us who have had our souls snatched away. How do we tend to our souls when they've been hurt repeatedly? Yeah. name of the guy that wrote this book one time where all the gay people walked out the church on Sunday morning. You know, it was great. This is a book, I forgot this guy, he wrote a series of books, oh, great writer, fiction, where all the gay people walked out the church on Sunday morning, you know. Or you all sometimes hear, what would the church be like if all the women left on Sunday morning? That kind of serious protest. I don't know that I'm advocating that, although I've got up and walked out of quite a few churches, because I just, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't have the stomach for some of the stuff that goes on in churches. But I, I do think you're on point. Church seems to me, there are too many churches that seem to me to be nothing more than institutional voyeurs, you know, wanting to look in on the, what, what we do with our bodies as LGBTQ persons 
in terms of sex, if we're really honest about it, what goes on in our bedrooms, how do we do that, you know? Uh, and, but not enough attention to the vast, I mean, the majority of my day is spent outside of my home, unless I'm writing. The majority of my day is spent doing the things that everybody else does. And so the church would do well to attend to how I live my, my day, you know? To offer, I don't think we have enough about uh, theological ethics for us all, okay? Which is why we have so many, you know, you, 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 you have so, so much immorality right within the church itself. The church is a microcosm of the larger society. And so we have to tend to those, we have to tend to some very serious, serious issues uh, and not uh, the, the matter of what we are doing in the, in the bedroom. At one point I wanted to write, my first book I wanted to be a salacious erotica, theological erotica. Oh, I was going, oh, I was going, I was going to set the church aflame. <laughs> Oh, I was going to, ooh, ooh, I was going to really, oh, I was going to do it. It was going to be salacious, do you hear me? Uh, then I thought about it and I said, I will not give them that. I will not give them that. I will not allow them to peer into my life or anyone else's life in that, in that way. Uh, and I will attend to the things that make us human beings, the common denominators of life and see if we can move forward towards freedom together in that way. So, yeah, that's, that's how I look at it nowadays. I'm, tr I'm trying, as, as you hear, I, I'm trying to unpack some things that, are, that will make, that make life worth living for us all, whether we're black, brown, queer, straight, cisgender. I'm, tr I'm trying to, to tap into how we live and move about and how we breathe and how we attend to this earth. I haven't said enough about theological ecology. And human beings, the way we treat each other, really, it really, in, in, for lack of a better, better phrase, it bleeds out into the soil. If the soil could talk, if soil could talk, y'all, what would soil say about how we have treated what God has given us? And we treat the earth horribly, and we treat ourselves horribly. If we can begin with taking maybe the, instead of so much attention to how we treat one another, we, I'm glad that others are beginning to pay attention to how we treat the earth, because it is due also that kind of tending. This is just a note for you, mm -hmm. a footnote. That sounds like Flannery O'Connor's uh, Blood so Soaked Soil of the South. Text me. I will. So yeah. that's, is, that's very Flannery O'Connor about the way that we treat one another. And you know, when you said that, you know what I thought of? What my parents used to tell me about Georgia? Red clay of Georgia? You know? You all know, well, you probably, well, in many black communities, when we think about Georgia, we say the, the, the soil is red because it's been stained with the blood of the enslaved. Of course, you know, that's, that's folklore. Dr. Lightsey, yes. how have you cultivated your own mindset of resistance? Um, I'm very much in step with community. I believe in accountability and so I try not to be a long ranger when it comes to liberation and and resistance I try to learn from others who are at the forefront of resistance you know I'm getting much older you know I've been I've been um, in liberation in the movement for the liberation of black bodies uh, since the 
desegregation of the schools. I was part of the first, my community were put on buses. We were the first to be put on buses to desegregate schools in the South. We had bomb threats, we had eggs thrown at our buses, rocks thrown at our buses, all kinds of horrible things. This is not new to me, okay? And one of the things that my mother taught me in standing in her kitchen when I was afraid to go to school, she looked at me and she said, child, you stay with your people. And she was teaching me something about resistance and accountability that I still hold near and dear today. So again, account being in a community of accountability and trying to learn in, 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 in theology, we, talk, we use the word discernment, okay? Discernment is what keeps us from being fanatics, I think. You know, this give and take, this communication between one another, this learning from one another, learning history, learning steps, learning methodology, learning how to organize, learning how to stay safe. We do that best in community. So that's how I cultivate. Other things that I do is just a lot of self-care. Because you don't take care of yourself, you can't resist too long. Thank you. You're welcome. And speaking of accountability, as I'm listening to you today, I'm realizing that what we're really dealing with is this unbalanced accountability scale in which churches are using biblical text as a way to hold people accountable. So the question then becomes, how do we hold those in leadership accountable for their inaccountability? Or hold, how do we hold them accountable to a, a loving God instead of their missed biblical interpretation when it comes to accountability? So rich here. Um... I think we have to do, I mean, so the text talks a lot about slavery and uses the word slaves, at least in the New Testament and uh, Old Testament too, and biblical scholar here, and, and our ancestors use, and we go to some of the quadrilateral, they use reason and experience to combat that, okay? to say, this is what you're telling me. Paul says, be obedient, slaves be obedient. But, but the, just imagine, this is, the, this is how I think we just, we, we just deal with illogic. If our ancestors had believed in the literal interpretation of the text, we would not have had the slave rebellions. They saw something different in the text. We, how could we have walked towards liberation if we saw ourselves as, as slaves forever? We had to, in some ways, stand up against the text itself, resist the text itself. And I, I'm not against resisting the text. You know, I accept the text as canon, okay, as canon. And, and, and at the point at which someone makes the text, um, and I basically idolizes the text. That's dangerous for us all. And that, the ch this is Pentecostal too. The church has a way that it makes people fear for their lives, fear for their very lives off the basis of scripture. Pastors can stand in the pulpit and quote scripture to you. Naive Christians to make you feel like when you walk out the door of the church, God's wrath is going to hit you because you're such a sinner going to hell. Okay? This is why at funerals people use the text to scare people into getting saved. We have to get to the point where we refuse to accept the text as a burden and as a yoke on our souls. The text must be canon. It must not be it must not be a chain of bondage. And too many people are sitting in church in bondage. And part of what I try to do is free people to live life and to appreciate, the, and to appreciate God's spirit still operating and speaking to us in extra canonical ways.
So my question is, so the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit with you, your counselor, because there is stuff you can't understand. I really think, and I'm asking you, do you think that the whole LGBTQ question, I have quotes around that, is being answered by the work of the Holy Spirit today and the church is resisting the work of the Holy Spirit? That's the unforgivable sin. So I don't want to, in some ways, I don't want to make the LGBTQ community an exceptional community. So by that I mean that the work of the Holy Spirit is the work for us all. And nobody can be free, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer, until we all get free. So we are not an, ex an exceptional class of people. We are part of a collective body. And remember I talked about embodied mutuality? And so we see the Holy Spirit working towards our, all of our good, towards all of our good. Then we can really talk about liberation then we can really talk about freedom. That's why I try to hold all of that together. The Williams Lecture happened once a year, sometimes twice a year. There won't be another one this year. But the quality of conversations we are capable of having if we will engage each other is immeasurable. I pray that you have been challenged, as I have been, that you have lots to think about, as I do, and that you will prayerfully engage this further, not just with Dr. Lysi and her writings, but within community, because that turns out to be the point. May God be with you as you go to rest tonight. May you safely arrive where you're going. May you live in peace. Amen. <laughs>